Okay, we're in the book of First Samuel. Uh, we're going to study here about the time of the United Kingdom. Uh, we're in the 18th chapter, and really going to begin down around verse 6. And like I said, we're not doing a verse-by-verse -verse study of it, just uh, going through, uh, looking at the high points of this. Uh, and it's taken quite a while to get through this anyway. But anyhow, uh, talking here about the hatred of Saul for David. Uh, we know that uh, what's happened here, that, that Saul uh, is an individual who, who's been jealous of David. And his jealousy is what leads to his hatred. Now, why was he jealous of David? Yes, that, that's part of it, but there's something that happened before then. What was it? His popularity. Uh, David has come to visit with his brothers who are in Saul's army. He's bringing food for them to learn how they're doing, to go back and tell his father. But while he's there, it's when the, the giant Goliath comes out and makes his boast and makes his challenge to let any of the champions of the Israelites come out and fight against him. And if they defeat him, then the Philistines will serve them. But if, if he defeats the Israelite champion, then Israel will have to serve the Philistines. And nobody's willing to accept that challenge, except when David hears it. He's, he's embarrassed, as it were, ashamed that there's nobody among Israel to accept that challenge. So he tells the king, don't let, anybody, mighty, don't let anybody's heart uh, bother them. He said, I'll go. And, uh, and he did. He went out there and defeated Goliath. And uh, when he came back from, from defeating Goliath, if you look at it in the, in the context here that's given here, uh, when he comes back, look at verse, uh, verse 7. Well, let me pick up to verse 6. As they were coming home, when David returned from slaying the Philistine, the women came out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with timbrels, with songs of joy, and with instruments of music. And the women sang to one another as they made merry, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. So in other words, they're ascribing to David. You know, David's done ten times more than what Saul has done. You know, Saul was a, a great king. I mean, he was a warrior. Uh, that led them into battle against the Philistine as well as the other enemies that they had and had been successful in it. Uh, but now, here's David. Uh, the people are saying David's done more than that. They're giving greater honor to David than they gave to the king. And that's why the king then becomes suspicious, you know. And, and in his own mind, Saul is thinking, what more could David want than my kingdom? I mean, he's already got all the glory. It's going to him instead of to me. The people are praising him for all that he's done rather than praising me. So what more could he want except the kingdom? That's what he's fearful of, uh, that he thinks that's what David's after. Well, David's not after it. David's already been promised by God he's going to be the king. Uh, he's already been chosen. He's been uh, anointed by Samuel to be the next king. Uh, he's been described by God as a man after his own heart. But David's not actively seeking it. He's not planning on trying to kill Saul so he can take over. Uh, he is serving Saul faithfully in Saul's army. Uh, it does that. But now, the, the question is, uh, that, that comes up a lot of times, if, if you read that as it's given here, it sounds like that uh, the women began singing these praises to David after what? After the battle with, the, with Goliath. Immediately after that, uh, the text as I'm reading here, now this is a revised standard. Uh, the text says, As they were coming home, when David returned from slaying the Philistine. Now, Brother Burton Kaufman said he doesn't believe that that came immediately after he killed the Philistine. And, and he, has, he has several reasons why he, he expresses that thought. And, uh, and I thought really made sense about it. Uh, number one, killing one man is not the type of thing that's going to inspire women to say, you kill 10,000. I mean, you know, we may idolize people and brag about them, but that's going a little bit overboard to attribute to them 10,000 uh, deaths of the enemies when it's only one. But also, in some of the texts, uh, they have a footnote that the word translated here, Philistine, singular, could be translated, as it's in some texts evidently, plural, Philistine. So after David came back from killing the Philistine, 
So this is not talking about when he came back immediately after his defeat of Goliath, but after other, other battles. Look, look what happens in the earlier part of chapter 18. Uh, after the battle with the, uh, with the Goliath, and he comes there and he's, he's speaking with Saul, and Jonathan's there, and the Bible says that Jonathan's soul was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him his own soul. Uh, and then verse 4, uh, Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him and gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his girdle. And look at verse 5. And David went out and was successful wherever Saul sent him, so that Saul set him over the men of war. And this was good in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. So after the defeat of Goliath, uh, Saul puts David over the army and he sends him out to do battle. And, and Saul was successful everywhere he went. Or excuse me, David was successful wherever he went. So evidently David, is after killing Goliath, made head of the army. He's involved in a lot of battles in which he evidently is successful in killing a number of the Philistines. And so it would have been after that time, after he had killed the Philistines, plural, uh, that the women began to sing like this. But whatever the time element involved is, the fact that they were attributing more to David than to Saul, that they were giving greater honor to this young man, David, than they were to their king, is the thing that caused uh, Saul to become jealous. Now, and to be filled with envy. Now, there's, there's a lot of problems that come into our lives whenever we are motivated by jealousy or by envy. Uh, what's the danger of being jealous or envious of someone? It's going to lead to hatred, which is exactly what happens here. You know, he, he hates David. You know, he, he is uh, angry at what is being said about David as opposed to which what's said about him. And, and the text says, uh, let's put this up. Yeah, look at verse 9 of chapter 18. It says, So Saul eyed David from that day forward. From that day on, after hearing the women praising David more than they do Saul, from that time on, Saul keeps his eye on David. Now, again, I like what uh, was said by that in, in regard to that by Brother Burton Kaufman. He says this means that from that day forward, David or Saul's jealousy and envy and hatred of David would never be diminished. He looked at David constantly. You know, we do that. Got an eye on you. Well, that's what he was uh, with David. Saul was eyeing David constantly. And he would never get over that jealousy and envy that he had toward him. And that jealousy and envy that he has is what's going to lead eventually to his attempt to kill David. So you've got jealousy that leads to hatred, and hatred that leads to, leads to him trying to kill David on this occasion. Uh, uh, so Saul tries to kill David. We look at the text here when he talks about that. Uh, and this hatred that he has for him and his wanting to destroy uh, David. Uh, let's see if I put that up here. Yeah. Look at that. It says, And it happened on the next day that the distressing spirit from God came upon Saul, and he prophesied inside the house. So David played music with his hand as at other times, but there was a spear in Saul's hand. And Saul cast the spear, for he said, I will pin David to the wall. But David escaped his presence twice. Two different times the effort is made by Saul here to kill David. Now here's the problem with jealousy and with envy. Jealousy and envy is going to lead to hatred. And hatred eventually will lead to trying to take one's life. Now we shouldn't be surprised by that. Uh, if we're familiar with the New Testament, 1 John 3.15, John says, whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Why is hatred, why is a person that hates his brother, why is he called a murderer? That, that's the beginning of the process. So many times, murder is committed because of hatred. When people become angry at someone, uh, and, and it leads to their trying to take their life of them, and that's what's happening here. And so that's why we've got to control, you know, this, this idea of jealousy or envy of other people. 
because that's going to lead to hatred. And if that's not checked, if it's not handled properly, that'll lead uh, to people killing or at least trying to. In this instance, that's what he did. He's trying to kill David, but he does not succeed in that. Uh, two different times, David was able to escape, uh, and evidently, uh, you know, uh, this may be the working of God. I mean, nothing is said about any kind of miraculous deal, but, but God caring for David because God has plans for David. He's, like I said, he's already had him anointed to be the king to rule over them. So Saul tries not once but twice to, to kill David, and as a result, uh, you know, David has to flee. But the text goes on and tells us uh, that David was prospering in all his ways. God's with him, and God's caring for him and blessing him and, uh, and seeing to it that David prospers because God has great things in plan for him. Now, th this is all kind of strange here. Uh, the text brings out how that David was given Saul's daughter Michael to be his wife. Now, remember back when David first came to visit his brothers and the battle lines are drawn up between the Philistines and the Israelites uh, and, and David hears Goliath making his boast and David asked a question of those men. What shall be done to the man that destroys Goliath? And what did they tell David? Yeah. You know, the king will give you his daughter in marriage. That was one of the things that was promised. Well, uh, when, when David is victorious, you know, Saul does give him his daughter, but he doesn't give him Michael uh, to be uh, uh, David's wife at that time. Uh, look over here at, at verse uh, 17. Then Saul said to David, Here's my elder daughter, Merab. I will give her to you for a wife. Only be valiant for me and fight the Lord's battle. For Saul thought, let not my hand be upon him, but let the hand of the Philistines be upon him. And David said to Saul, Who am I, and who are my kinsfolk, my father's family in Israel, that I should be son-in-law to the king? But at that time, when Merab, Saul's daughter, should have been given to David, she was given to Adriel, the Mahotharite, for a wife. So Saul, I'll give her to you. He was given to him in hope that he would able to use her as a means of bringing about David's death, and we're going to see how he's going to plan that also with Michael. But uh, later on, he gives her away to somebody else. And so David never marries her. He doesn't have the oldest daughter of Saul. But then Saul learns that Michael loves David, and that encourages Saul. Saul said, this is just going to fit perfectly into my plan. If she loves Saul, I will give her, or David, I'll give her to David to be his wife. And so that's the promise. That's what he's wanting to do to give to David. But even so, David is not, you know, uh, too, uh, too keen on that because of the fact that David says, I have no wealth. Uh, back then, whenever someone was betrothed in marriage, uh, usually the groom had to give something uh, to the uh, father of the bride. Uh, not really a payment, but that was just the thing you did. And Saul here is the king, and here's David, and David says, you know, I don't have anything. Uh, you know, he views his family as being poor, and, uh, and evidently that's so. Uh, remember his older brother told him, where are those few sheep that you're supposed to be caring for? So they don't have a large flock, so he doesn't have a lot of money. And so he says to these people who tell him that, you know, the king has sent these people today to say, listen, you know, Saul, you know, cares very much about you, and Saul wants you to be his son-in-law. He wants you to marry his daughter. And David says to the man, do you not understand what, what it means to be the son-in-law of the king? Uh, I'm of a poor family. You know, here's his humility. We, we're not of importance, and I don't have anything to give to the king in this regard. And so what do I do? So they go back and tell Saul, Saul sends him back. So you tell David, I don't require anything except 100 foreskins from the Philistines. Now he thought in doing that, that when David goes out to try to kill 100 Philistines, that he himself is going to be killed. Now, if you look at what Saul says, Saul says, let not my hand be upon him. Uh, he's going to let somebody else do the killing for him. 
till it's a blessing too late. But David knows, you know, that God's with him. He goes out, and how many Philistines does he kill? 200. He doubles what Saul has required of him. He goes out and he kills 200 of them and brings their foreskins back to the king. And when Saul sees that, now Saul knows that God is truly with David. And it is just nothing really that he can do about it. He, he knows that he's not going to be killed by the Philistines or anybody else. If he's going to be killed, Saul feels like he's going to have to do it himself uh, to bring about the death of David and that. And so uh, he, he, he's not going to do it. But Saul continues his effort to kill him. His next idea, he commands his son Jonathan and all of his servants, kill David. Again, now, it's going to be at his command, but he's not going to do it literally. You have all of these people uh, to put David to death. That's his desire. Uh, Jonathan, you and all the servants are to kill David. Now, Jonathan, of course, isn't going to do that. He loves David as his own soul, and he treats him that way. And so he, he warns David about his father's hatred for him and what his father is planning to do to bring about the death of David. Uh, and so... He tells David, you go hide uh, so that Saul cannot find you, and that, that's what he does. And then Jonathan goes and he talks to his father. And in talking to his father, he reminds Saul of everything that David's done. When none of your men were willing to accept the challenge of the giant, David did. And David went out there and fought for Israel. God was with him. He defeated Goliath and gained a great victory for Israel that day. And Saul, what was your reaction to that? And Jonathan tells him. How had Saul reacted when David killed Goliath? Yeah, he was happy. He rejoiced in it, you know. And so here's a young man who's put his own life in danger to destroy our enemy, gives us a great victory over the Philistines. And Saul, even yourself, recognized how valuable that was to you to you and your kingdom, and you were happy about it. You were rejoicing at what David had done. So why in the world would you want to kill him now? That, that, here, here's somebody that's done his best to fight for you, to help you out in your kingdom, give you this, and now you want to turn around and kill him? And evidently, Saul's heart still has enough tenderness in it that he listens to his son Jonathan. And he swears to Jonathan, as the Lord lives, I will not kill David. And so Jonathan can go out and tell David about it and brings David back. He's brought back into the fellowship again with Saul. Uh, and, and things are really back to normal, as it were. Uh, but it's not long. It's not long at all before things begin to change. He listens to Jonathan, promise not to kill David, but he soon forgot about that promise. And he makes his efforts to kill David again. And this is the thing about, about Saul. It, it's, it's kind of a, a, an up and down with him. I don't know if this is because of the, the evil spirit that he has that, uh, that's causing all these problems, causing him to behave that way. But, you know, he, he's listening. That sometimes he's reasoned with by Jonathan, and he accepts it. And then at other times he just goes completely uh, away again uh, and turns against David, and again brings about his efforts to kill David. Uh, this time, Michael is going to be the one to intervene to help David to escape. Saul sends his people, his soldiers, to kill David. And when they come, and Michael knows about it, she has David, helps David to escape by letting him out the window. And then she takes an image. Uh, my Bible gives us a footnote on that, a teraphim. You know what a teraphim is? That, that, that's a little idol. Uh, that's the kind of thing that, that Rachel stole and took with them when they left her home. And so they had that, and she lays it in the bed, and she makes a pillow out of goat's hair and lays up at the head of it and, and covers it over. Uh, and, and she tells these men when they come to get David, she says, uh, David is asleep, he's sick, and he can't go. 
and they, they look in and see, that, you know, obviously there's someone in the bed it looks like, and they go back and tell Saul what's happened. And Saul said, you go get him and bring him on his bed that I can kill him. Saul is now determined and he's not going to let anything. He's not interested in somebody else doing You bring him here to me so I can kill him to make sure that what I want done is carried out. So when they go back, of course, they, that's when they discover that uh, this is uh, just that teraphim laying there, that image laying in the bed, not David. He's already gone. And now he's mad at Michael, his daughter. Uh, you know, why have you turned against me and you've helped David to escape? How did she save her life? You know what she told her father? Yeah. David said, you know, uh, threatened her to kill her because she says, why should I die? You know, in other words, she was telling him that's what was going to happen to me. If I didn't help David out, if I didn't help him to escape and do all of this, then he was going to kill me, which that was not true. Uh, but I think she was fearful of her father that she's helped David escape. He might kill her. And, you know, that's a possibility of it because that's the way Saul has gotten at this point in his life. Uh, not, not insane, but mad in one sense that, that he's willing to do that, uh, to put him down. Uh, so David has to flee, and, and the Bible says that he, he fled to Ramah. You can see that up there at the top of the map. I got it circled in red. Uh, Ramoth was one of those cities where Samuel uh, would travel to, uh, and his judgeships. He had a circuit that he would make, and Ramah was one of the cities he goes. So that's where David goes here initially. Uh, he flees to Ramah uh, to hide there from, uh, from David. Uh, now, now Jonathan comes to help David a second time. He's going to do the same thing that he did before. He's going to talk with his father. He tells David, I'm going to talk with my father. And if I find out he's really intent on killing you, I'll warn you so you can escape. But if not, you know, then be like before, you can come home. And, and he goes and he talks to his father again, but this time he doesn't have the success he had before. Now, we mentioned this in our Sunday class, looking at the uh, Beatitudes. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they should be called sons of God. Uh, a peacemaker is somebody who tries to make peace. You may not succeed in it, but you try. Jonathan succeeded the first time, but this time he doesn't. And Saul's not willing to accept David back. He is determined that he's going to put him to death. And now he's angry at, at Jonathan because Jonathan has been the one that's been trying to, to spare him. Uh, and, and Jonathan, when David tells him about it, uh, you know, it, it's kind of hard for Jonathan to accept that his father's just intent on killing David. And David talks to him. He took an oath, and he said, Your father certainly knows that I have found favor in your eyes. And he has said, Do not let Jonathan know this, lest he be grieved. For truly, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, there is but a step between me and death. Now, Jonathan, it may be hard for you to accept that this is what your father's like, that he's intent on killing me. But now listen, look how he says, truly as the Lord lives, it's, it's almost he's calling God as a witness in this, that what he is saying is true. And, and what he's saying is to Jonathan, Jonathan, your father is so intent on killing me, there's just a step between me and death. You know, he, he could be put to death at any time, at any moment by Saul. Now the statement that he made there, made there there's but a step between me and death, uh, is an important statement. There's a lot it has to say in that. It's a lot that, that it teaches us about death. Uh, you may have heard people use this before in funerals, but I think it's important not just in time for a funeral, but just something we need to learn and understand about death. A lot of people say, I, oh, I don't want to think about death. I don't, I don't want to talk about that. I don't want to even think about it. But death is a reality. It's going to come to all of us at some time unless Christ comes back. Uh, we're all going to die, and, and we need to face that. And so there's certain things here. Talking about. It's a step between me and death, and, and just look at this. Number one, that death is a certain step. 
we know we're going to die. And there, there's several verses in the Bible that I've looked at. In 1 Kings 2, 1 and 2, this is when David himself is near death, and he's talking to his son Solomon. And look what he says. Now the days of David drew near that he should die, and he charged Solomon his son, saying, I go the way of all the earth. Be strong, therefore, and prove yourself a man. You know, the Bible has a lot of ways of, of speaking about death. When Jesus talked about death, how did he describe it? As asleep. You know, when Lazarus had died, he said, uh, our friend Lazarus is asleep. And they said, oh, well, Lord, if that's true, that's good. And then Jesus had to tell them plainly he's dead. But Jesus viewed death as, as asleep. But I like here the way uh, it, David describes death as he's talking to his son Solomon. He says, I go the way of all the earth. That's what death is. It's the way that every living being has to go. It's not the way of some of the earth. It's the way of all the earth. And so that, that he knows that. That's what death is. It's, it's a step that all men have to take. Hebrews 9, 27, And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment. Death is the appointment for everybody. And so when we talk about death being, you know, he says there's but a step between me and death. Uh, it's a certain step that everybody has to take. Then one other, Ecclesiastes 8, verse 8, first part of it. Solomon says, No one has power over the spirit to retain the spirit, and no one has power in the day of death. According to James, when does physical death occur? Right. When the spirit leaves the body. As the body without the spirit is dead. When your spirit leaves your body, that's when physical death occurs. But look at what Solomon says about that. He says, no one has power over the spirit to retain the spirit. In other words, when that time for death comes, and it's going to come to all of us, none of us has the power to retain that spirit, to hold it, to hold on to life, to keep it. But rather, he says there, no one has power in the day of death. One translation says, no one has authority over death. And so, you know, we can't say, well, hey, death may be for everybody, but not for me. I, I'm going to refuse, if you don't mind. Uh, I'm going to refuse to accept the invitation of death, and I'm not going to die. I'm going to hold my spirit within this body. And Solomon says, no, you can't do that. Death is a certainty for everyone. So it's a certain step. Number two, death is an uncertain step. Well, is that a contradiction? He said it's a certain step, then said it's uncertain. Well, all right, you don't know when it might come. So it's uncertain in that. You don't know when, you don't know how uh, that it might come. You know, uh, a lot of people have then ideas in their mind how they would like to die. Uh, you know, that they'd like to die between clean sheets and bed at home surrounded by their family. But it doesn't always happen that way. Uh, you know, we, we don't know how we might die. Uh, Jimmy Allen, in one of the lessons he taught about death, he talked about the different ways that men die. And he talked about one funeral he had to preach where a man died, uh, got into a fight in a bar. Uh, and a guy was blocking the door, wasn't going to let him out. And he said, you're either going to let me out or I'm going to go through you. And the man wasn't going to let him out. He tried, and the man killed him. And he fell dead. And as he did, uh, the man steps over him, and as he died, he cursed the man. Uh, you know, nobody wants to die like that. Uh, but we don't know. It's uncertain as to how we might die. Uh, thirdly, death is the final earthly step. Uh, some of those passages we've already looked at, looked at uh, emphasize that fact. That it's the last thing we're going to do in this life. Romans 7, 1 and 2 or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives? For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. Uh, death ends all uh, of our responsibilities in this life. It's the last earthly step we're going to do. The last thing we have to do in life is, is to die. Death is a parting step. It's a separation from this life and everything we know. It's a separation from everybody we know. Again, James says, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So this body, once that spirit leaves it, uh, that 
departing step, the Spirit leads the body. And that Spirit goes back into the control of God. Uh, death is a solitary step. You can't take anybody with you. Uh, when you. When you make that step from life to death, you, you have to go along. Uh, there used to be a song that uh, I remember Johnny Cash used to sing, you know, that spiritual song about you've got to walk that lonesome valley. You've got to walk it by yourself. Nobody else can walk it for you. You've got to walk it by yourself. It is. Death is a solitary step. Uh, 1 Kings 2, 1 and 2, again, we looked at a while ago. Uh, David says, I go the way of all the earth. Be strong, therefore, and prove yourself a man. Solomon can't go with him. Uh, David says, I go. So he's going to have to make that trip alone. Uh, Psalms 23, 4, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Uh, David had that assurance that when he died, though no man could go with him, he was confident of the fact that Christ would be with him, uh, that God's going to be with him. Uh, he says, for you are with me. Even though he's going through the shadow of death, uh, he doesn't have to fear because God's with him. And then finally, death should be the last earthly step to the Lord Jesus Christ. When we're obedient to God, live for him as his children, uh, yeah, it is. It's the last step we take to go from this life into the presence of God. Have you ever wondered if, if a baby could really think and understand what it must be like when a child is born? You know, he's been nine months in a womb. Uh, he's in a place of comfort. He's in a place where he's safe uh, under normal circum circumstances. Uh, and, and, and everything's taken care of for him. And then one day, something, something starts happening. Uh, and, and it's different. And uh, suddenly he's turned, or she's turned around, and all of a sudden she finds herself being forced through some narrow opening into a light, and the first thing she remembers, somebody grabs her up and slaps her on the backside, and she starts crying. Now, if she could reason and think about all that, she's thinking, what a horrible thing this is. I've just left this place of comfort where everything's taken care of there and brought out of this world. The first thing I experience is being slapped. Uh, well, we, we know, no, that, that's, not a, that's just the step from one life to another life. And we need to understand it's the same way with death. Now, you know, we may be terrified of the thought about death, but realize that's just a step from this life into that life we have to be with God for all eternity. Uh, and it's not something to be fearful of, not to be terrorized by, but simply realize it, it's just a step, the last step we take in order to be with the presence of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 6 to 8. So we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. I like the Revised Standard translation of that where it says where we're, we're rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. Uh, going home. Uh, leaving one home for another. Uh, leaving a home uh, that's old and ramshackle and going to a home that's new and beautiful and will never wear out. Uh, and that's death. That's the death for the, for the Christian. Uh, when uh, David talks about it in the book of Psalms, uh, he makes the statement, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. So David, trying to impress upon Jonathan, your daddy is intent on killing me, uh, that there's just a step between me and death. It's something that could happen at any moment. It's that close to me constantly. And David never knew for sure what was going to happen to him. Uh, so David and Jonathan make a plan. Uh, again, Jonathan says, I'll find out from my father what his feelings are toward you, and if he's intent on killing you, I'll let you know about it. Uh, and, and, and if not, I'll let you know that it's safe for you to come back. Now, how's he going to do that? How's John going to be able to warn him? Yeah, have the little boy shoot some arrows, going to shoot three arrows as if he's aiming at some target. And uh, if Saul is still angry, uh, what's he going to tell him? What's he going to tell that little boy when he sends him to get the arrows? Yeah, the arrows are beyond you. Keep going. Well, that's, that's a sign to David. David, keep going. But if I say to the young boy, come to arrows on this side of you, then David, it's safe to come back. You can come home. 
So that's the plan that he makes for him, uh, to, to be able to warn David and let him know whether or not he needs to flee or whether or not he needs to come home. And, and he finds out very quickly that what his father's intentions are, that Saul is still angry at David. He's still determined on putting David to death. And so he has to warn him to leave. But now, here's a statement. Again, this, this is one of those statements in the Old Testament that I truly love. When, when Jonathan's talking to David, before he sends him off, after he, he determines that, that Saul's still wanting to kill David, he says to David, Tomorrow is the new moon, and you will be missed because your seat will be empty. Jonathan loved David as he loved his own soul. David has been the one who's been invited to attend the meals every night at the king's table. But now he can't come back because Saul's seeking to kill him. And so Jonathan says, you know, tomorrow's a new moon and you'll be missed because your seat's going to be empty. We can look at that at two other ways in which we can apply that as we close our lesson for tonight. Number one, I've used that several times in funerals, but especially when, when it's been involved family members. Uh, to say to someone, there's an empty seat in the family of whoever it is that's passed away. And there's a sadness there because that seat is empty. Uh, but for a Christian, that empty seat here means another seat filled in heaven. And so, you know, there, there's joy and comfort to be found in that. But also, I think about it here at church. We come together to worship God on Sundays or on Wednesday nights, and, and you look around, uh, and, and we're creatures of habit. And that generally means that when we come to worship, we have a place where we're going to sit. And, and you can almost tell when, you, when you've been there for a while, you begin to recognize where people sit, and, and you'll look and you'll notice an, an empty seat. You know, somebody's not there, and you begin to wonder why. Well, we ought to be like Jonathan there with David. Uh, <clears throat> when we see an empty seat in church, we ought to miss whoever that is, miss them enough to contact them and find out why they're absent. Uh, and, and if it's something we can help them with, encourage help them with, to get them back to be where they need to belong and to fill up that seat again. Okay, our time's gone. Let's, let's close with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your love and all you do for us in life. Thank you for allowing us to be here this evening. And we pray you dismiss us in your care and help us, Father, to be strengthened in our inner man and help us to be the kind of people that you want us to be, that we will bring glory and honor to thee, that we will be an encouragement and help to one another. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.